Hi everyone, this is the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to Chris Cole. Chris is a psychologist and life coach who hosts the podcast with the highly original name, Waking Up Bipolar. And he's also the author of The Body of Chris, a memoir of obsession, addiction, and madness, where he talks about his own experiences with the spiritual dimension of bipolar disorder. So, hello, Chris. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we have each other. I'm so, I'm so used to being interviewed that I said thanks for having me because I thought you were interviewing me, but thanks for coming. Well, hopefully we can hold each other's hands throughout this process, you know. I think that's ideally what we're doing. And, you know, my... My my own podcast is just a big advertisement for people to get to you. So it's all good. Cool, cool. Yeah. And we were talking before we started recording that, you know, tell them where you got this highly original name, Waking Up Bipolar. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, bipo bipolar is a very fun word. Uh, get branded and diagnosed. And uh, some people even find their way into thinking they're bipolar or their especially their loved ones are bipolar um and waking up is is waking up we were asleep now we're awake and you have um you had bipolar and waking up as two buzzwords which were very important to use and lean into and in some ways it was like homage to your work you know you you had a you were going down a particular track and um, you were doing this offering that people were starting to gravitate to. I certainly was. And I was studying transpersonal psychology at the same time I was discovering you. And um, I think with language branding, it has to like, it has to build on itself, you know, like think about how far the diagnostics have gone because everyone buys into it, feeds it, you know, and it grows and grows and grows. And uh, I think transpersonal psychology, the ideas that you were presenting, um, could use someone like me just like uh, pushing it along with you, you know? Yeah, yeah. And of course, you're talking about my YouTube channel, Bipolar or Waking Up, right? So, okay. you know, you, you called me and said, is it okay if I use uh, this name, Waking Up Bipolar? Are you cool with that? And I was like, yeah. And and my feeling was the same. Like there might be differences in the way we've seen things or, or go about our lives. But in the bigger picture, the one thing no one talks about is that these, you know, um, episodes of acute psychosis that get labeled bipolar, they've got a really strong spiritual side to them that nobody talks about very much. People are afraid to talk about it. Uh, psychiatrists don't look at it. They don't do any research on it. Even most psychologists are a little bit like guarded around the whole thing. Like, well, I understand that's your perspective on what you think happened to you, but nobody is going like, well, wait a second. Why is it that everybody who has, you know, bipolar disorder has spiritual experiences in their mania? Like that should be something that's studied or appreciated in some way. And pretty much you were the next guy on board, you know, in, in looking at that. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there was an upswell happening and, and you were prescient in your recognition of that, you know, so mm -hmm. I think at the same time that I was discovering you, I was formulating my own thoughts around uh, the body of Chris, which was the this I felt on I felt like there was nothing more important I could do in the world than tell my story of spiritual awakening and mental illness. I felt like this was uh, critical, critical stuff. And then the more I started like researching how to promote the book or how to get it funded or published or whatever, I started realizing like there's something's happening, you know, there's a, uh, it's percolating. Um, some of the research is taking hold. Transpersonal psychology is becoming something that people can at least find and reference and uh, say something about. And, you know, just just it just so happens i was watching a nami video that was shared to me by a friend and uh the guy references you your youtube channel and nami's like oh, really? super mainstream and yeah it is like the it's like the the long mama bear papa arm of of advocacy and 
it's got a very, huge, huge reach. Very conservative organization too. I mean, yeah. really conservative. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that somebody is referencing you and thinking they're going to find some, you know, foothold in all these, uh, transpersonal psychology ideas is a, is a pretty big deal. And I think that's kind of how, how movements tend to work is like, you know, you, you get these little, these little like bubbling, 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 and then the whole pot boils over, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it hasn't boiled over yet. After 14 years, it's getting a little frustrating for me to be quite honest. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <It hasn't... laughs> I, I think it will. And I think it's going to be a combination of, uh, artists and, uh, people that are uh, hypo grandiose, I guess, so to speak, and mm, they yeah. think they can change the world. And and we reference you when we do that, you know, <laughs> when we have our little episodes where we think we're going to uh, be the next Dr. King or something like that. And we say, Sean Blackwell taught me this in a YouTube video. Well, that's part of the reason, and maybe this is a good place to get into it, why I decided to start a podcast mm -hmm. was because I don't feel like this subject – there's been a lot of interest really keen from some certain individuals, but I don't feel like this subject of like the spiritual dimension of disorders is part of regular conversation, even in the alternative spheres. It's, right. it's quite narrow. And so I wanted to do something that could sort of create a bit of a culture around it, you know, where more people are talking about this issue, you know, and that gets me maybe to my first question. I really loved, you know, talking about, spiritual dimension, you know, titling your book, The Body of Chris was like, really, you know, I love the title. I was just curious where that came from. I guess I'm just notorious for uh, titling things that are just going to uh, pop somebody into somebody else's sphere, you know, because The Body of Chris, you can't, you can't search The Body of Chris without Google auto-correcting The Body of Christ. So that's where the title comes from is, uh, you know, when, when I was, I was raised Catholic and in the church, the priest says the body of Christ before they give you communion. And, and in, uh, the image is, uh, it's not just, it's not just the Wakanda. It's also, um, uh, asking for a blessing, but passing on communion in the church. The idea of the image of the book with my arms folded is that I'm both present and not partaking it's like i'm in a liminal space in that image and i i saw spiritual awakening and madness like that like a liminal space where i'm not i'm not quite in consensus reality i'm not i'm not all the way into some sort of uh spiritual dimension it's like i'm i'm vacillating or suspended uh, between those spaces at the intersection of of psychology and spirituality. And that's where I was too. When I was in my experience, I didn't realize, I honestly didn't realize that what I had was being considered a, a mental disorder until it happened to my nieces 10 years later, my wife's nieces, you know. I was just like, I had a spiritual experience and these doctors have no idea what they're talking about. That was my orientation. And I mean, that got me through, you know, but for most people, even if they have an experience very similar to mine, like you did, it doesn't get them through, you know, it gets, you know, they, they start relapsing and impacts the families, impacts your lives in a pretty detrimental way. Right. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I think that's probably the biggest tragedy of, of science up until this point. And I, I do think it's changing, but the idea is that a discovery uh, a discovery is not uh, an opening into a new direction, but maybe is a closed presentation of reality. And uh, I think an example of that that's really common right now is uh, like polyvagal theory, this idea that the social engagement system is connected to the nervous system, like all throughout the body, through the face. Oh, okay. So uh, I say that because, you know, previously we, we, we might not have known scientifically that it would be important to read someone's face or engage with their facial expressions during psychotherapy. Like maybe they could just lay down and look away or stare up at the ceiling and we could sit behind mm -hmm. them, you know, this kind of stuff. And, 
the old Freudian style. Yeah, and it well, and it's also it's kind of like duh, you know, you can't mm. you can't relate to someone and not not have these neurological impressions in a lot of different ways, how their voice sounds, um, the way they're looking, where they're looking, uh, maybe their their eyes twitching when they talk about their you know their experience of something. I mean, there this stuff is can be common sense, but when we have when we have big scientific discoveries or scientific consensus, we we can take partial truths and make them universal truths. Yeah. Well, based on you know just sort of going off what you said here, you know when people are in a manic episode like the or the psychosis, we'll say that stuff is all super tuned in, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. You're picking up on the facial expressions, the nuances, the energy of everybody who's coming at you. And usually they're coming at you with a hell of a lot of fear, right? And so the whole thing just blows up, right? Yeah, and it's heightened. Yeah, yeah the yeah. senses are... And that that vividness of sensory input can can be overwhelming to the system, you know? And mm -hmm. I... I, I sort of look at it that way. Like, it's like I blow a fuse, you know, that's, that's how my spiritual uh, mania has been is, is a, it's an urgency. It's a, it's a, um, an, an indulgence into my experience where it start it starts to turn back on itself. So I have an exciting idea and like, I'm getting, it's like, I'm getting high on the excitement of the idea. And I keep, I keep churning it and churning it and churning it. And I make this making butter, you know, make it, I'm making mm. butter with this, with this thought content. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's not always a smooth experience. Yeah. Well, why don't you go back and tell us about how things got started for you down this bipolar journey? You know, your book is pretty wild. I mean, you don't yeah. meeting you and knowing you. I, I feel like when I read the book, I, I'm reading, um, I'm learning about a completely different person. Mm. You know? The book feels that way to me too. My story feels that way sometimes to me too. Like another, it was another life in a way. And the experience I have uh, initially was a lot of uh, rejection of my body. I want to say it that way, right? Like it be it. It began that way. Heavy kid. I ha I was super sensitive. Uh, I had this sort of late bloomer thing happening, and that wasn't just that wasn't just puberty. It was also development. Like I, I was late to speak, and I was late on a lot of stuff. And so I re I remember this sort of crescendo in high school where it's like all of a sudden I was maturing. I was keeping up and accelerating in my studies. And I started to get really into um, dating. I started getting really into uh, weightlifting and body transformation. And I started getting really into substances, uh, alcohol and marijuana specifically. And some, I guess some, ex some like supplements that sped me up like ephedrine and ephedrine like substances for for bodybuilding but i also started to use them recreationally and i just found like i never i never i never could use effectively like some of the people around me like i always took it too far i look at back on it now and i think i was really uncomfortable in my skin i i was constantly on edge you know and that that kept bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And then eventually I went to college and I told myself, yeah, I'll go to, I'll go to school early, which I did, um, to get out of the house and my oppressive regime of my parents, all this kind of stuff. And I had this, uh, experience where somebody in the fraternity I was pledging uh, there was a there was a mutual friend of everyone in the kind of Greek community at the University of Georgia, which was a big deal. And uh, and uh, this this kid died suddenly, unexpectedly in a boating accident. And I remember 
just getting grief stricken by my friend, my, my friend, my best friend who died uh, in a car accident a couple years prior. And I just never really made sense of it. Never really allowed myself to fully grieve. Um, whatever it was, it tapped like a deep well of, of existential grief, pain, confusion. And I couldn't stop crying this night. And that felt in and of itself, like this dark night kind of feel like I couldn't drink it away. I couldn't explain it away. I just was just devastated with grief. And I, I kind of fit in with the group of people I was with because everyone was grieving. So it was like, some people were consoling me. Like I really knew this kid. Well, I had no, I didn't even know his name. I don't think. And uh, yeah, but I was, I was so upset. So, so this, this so this whole episode at the university with this kid dying was just like this trigger that yeah. opened up uh, an unresolved trauma for you from a, a friend who died in a car accident earlier, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And all yeah. that went into it, you know, the, the many, many, many layers of what it means to be alive, what it means to be a, a child of, of God and what it means to be worthy of heaven. And, you know, just all these, all these huge, huge ideas of, of my existence just came like imploding in on me. Uh -huh. And then I couldn't sleep. I started, uh, I, you know, I had that kind of anxiety, like I had been drinking uh, for a while and, uh, I felt super anxious and really overwhelmed and I just slid. Like I remember going to Waffle House with my, my best friend, Austin, and I started talking about being the president of the United States and stuff. Like I started talking about the, our future is so wide open and we can be anything we want. We could be the president of the United States, like all this kind of stuff. And he mm -hmm. was like, you need to just like go see your family or something, you know? You're, you're really freaking out you know? you're out there yeah yeah really out there and then it continued uh to where i just kept climbing this sort of energetic psycho spiritual space uh kept kind of climbing that ladder to the point where i lost i just eventually lost reference to myself i felt like my entire existence was just a dream. And I said that to somebody, I, I was like, Oh, I really, I, th I really thought I was me, you know, I really thought this was my body. And it was everybody's <laughs> laughing because I was this, I've always been kind of a uh, gregarious in that way. It's sociable. People thought I was joking. They thought I was tripping. They thought I would, you know, they were asking me what I took. They were trying to manage me. And then, and then I started feeling claustrophobic. I punched one of my friends, told him he was the devil. And then I essentially just was rattling off, like, I guess, pro prophetic type of wisdom about how math was going to heal, was going to bring heaven on earth and all this kind of stuff in my dorm room lobby until the cops came. And, uh, Every, and then from there, it was like, I thought the I thought the police were the Pharisees and I was reliving this whole biblical narrative around uh, the Christ death. Wow. And were you Christ in this situation? In this situation, I was the second coming. Yeah, I was like the new version. Uh, but but what was incredibly unoriginal about it was I was just doing the whole thing again. Like <laughs> I was getting I was going to get crucified. And, you know, it was like this. Uh, it was just replaying this, that same narrative of, wow. of like having some kind of insight into God and being and then being persecuted for it. And, and seeing the police as Pharisees, that's pretty. That's a that's an original take. I, I haven't heard that one before. I've talked to a lot of people over the years. That's good. I, that's oh, a good part of the story. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was pretty <laughs> natural. Yeah. I'm curious. You mentioned thinking that you know you could have been the president or something like that. 
Did you have? I know you're a big Kanye West fan. Oh my god! At least for his music. I was curious what you thought about when he was announcing his presidency. Did it resonate with you? Oh, totally. Yeah, and I was I was hoping he could do it. You know, I I still I'm still a little bit on the Kanye West 2024 bandwagon. I I feel like <laughs> I feel like if he can just find the right running mate. Uh, it could happen. I love Kanye West. I love, I love where he comes from. And I think he's probably the most beautiful uh, out front story of this intersection of creativity, genius and madness. I hope one day he gets to address it. Um, but I, I think perhaps it might even be more effective to just have people speculate and him be an example of somebody that's inspiring and confusing and oftentimes infuriating. Yeah, I, I don't I don't actually know if he has bipolar disorder or not. Do you? Do you like they say he I does, heard but say he does, and then I heard him say he doesn't, and you know, I, I try to make it a practice to not uh I thought I went too far out on a limb just talking about him, to be honest. But I was just mm. so I myself was so inspired by it. I was like, oh, Kanye, you know, Kanye West is coming out with this. He's got the gentleman. He says something about his gentle mental. And I love that album, uh, Yay, where he, he talks about a lot about being bipolar and um, being diagnosed and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I hear people didn't really like the album, but that makes sense to me as a as someone who's often fringe. Well, getting back to to your story a little bit. So when in this first episode you had was was the drug use you were involved with at that time was it just marijuana or had you gotten other stuff as well at that point? Yeah, I got let's see. There was marijuana. We didn't call it Molly at the time. Ecstasy? Ecstasy, yeah, we called it ecstasy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I done ecstasy, I done uh mushrooms um it was all like it was all pretty standard i guess mm -hmm. you know nothing i mean i i was doing it with other people uh and that i think that was always my confusion around the the mystery of uh bipolar onset is like other people were doing the same thing I was, but I'm the only one that's running, th you know, running mad through my dormitory thinking I'm the second coming of Christ and going to get killed any second and all this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where I, I tend to lean into uh, neurological divergence or this sort of neurodiversity paradigm that's emerging around, um, people having unique neurological dispositions and that's both that's both shaped and uh molded through our experience and it's also something we're predisposed to we're born born certain ways and there you know it's well can you expand on it a little bit and just fill me in a little bit more on your take on sort of the neurological diversity aspect each of us is singularly unique Mm -hmm. Right. How, you know, how our, how our face is shaped, our fingerprints, the kaleidoscopic nature of our birth. Um, we, we've all hit, we've all hit the lottery, you know, we've all hit the mega jackpot in a way to, you know, being born as human beings. And we're, we're much more unique than something like a social security number. Right. Okay. We have, we have like, there, there's, there's just so much improbability that comes into being who we are and how we are, you know? Sure. And I think the nervous system is on, we're on the edge of um, understanding the nervous system in ways that we had not before. Mm -hmm. We're making sense of it in ways we had not before. And it's not just, it's not just one thing, you know? So we used to debate like nature and nurture uh, all the time, sure. we still do. 
But what happens when the nature nurture debate turns into the intersection of hundreds and thousands of, of possibilities, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we start, we start to be, uh, we start to be humbled by the fact that there's just so many factors that come, that come into how we are at any given time in any given embodiment. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the central nervous system. Do you see, you know, the disorder that you've got as, as connected, like deeply embedded in the central nervous system, as opposed to the psychiatry idea of, well, it's in your brain, everything's going on in your brain. Yeah, but, but much more than that. Like I, I think of, I think of like my body as being like a tree in a forest, you know, that tree can't be separated from the, the climate, the soil, the geographical location, the relationship to the sun, um, what kind of animals and bugs uh, cohabitate with the with the plant? There's too many factors that go into it for we for us to like put a put one of those vacuum seals over the tree and say this is tree, right? Okay. And I th- uh-huh. and I think that no matter how much we study the human body we're going to come back to the reality that everything is connected. Uh, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, you could could dial up or down any of these factors and you wouldn't have the same body. Yeah. I've given an analogy, you know, for some of my clients, I tell them, I say, imagine that you're a Ferrari, you know, this amazing car, Mm -hmm. but you're on a planet of dirt roads. Mm. Your Ferrari is going to get destroyed in about five minutes, right? It's mm-hmm. it's a nightmare. You're better off to be a Jeep if you're on a planet of, of uh, dirt roads. And right now, this is a planet of dirt roads, and you're suffering because you're a Ferrari. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and it's this, I think it's this sensitivity you've talked about, um, and maybe you can expand on that a little bit. I can tell you just from the people I've met, just an enormous amount of highly creative people. And there's research on that too. Highly creative people are more prone to disorders. They're also more prone to drug use, you know, mm-hmm. but more prone to disorders um, than the rest of the population. So I get a ton of artists and uh, musicians and actors who get in touch with me. I don't get many chemical engineers and accountants and, and this kind of person. You know, so the sensitivity is is a big thing. And I, I think that speaks to the, you know, neurological distinctiveness you're you're talking about. In some ways, it can be like, uh, you know, we can talk about like neurological synapses connecting where they weren't connected, uh, roads converging in the center of a town or there's so many different metaphors. But when I think about when I think about the practice of spiritual awakening, that's not just like the lightning bolt of, you know, a tree catches fire, but it's some sort of systemic uh, or or systematic practice of training in awakening. It's usually Mm -hmm. a training in sensitivity. It's usually a training in becoming more sensitive to subtle energy, uh, to the cues around people, the signs. It doesn't. Okay. I I think training and sensitivity is a nice definition of spiritual practice. Okay. Yeah. And so, what was your training in sensitivity? Like, where where did it go for you? Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it started with. It started with prayer and deep reflection you know, around just old school Catholic prayer, Catholic. Yeah. Uh, And we both started there. I started in Catholic schools too. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And I mean the, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to poo poo these things, you know, but the more I got into Buddhism, the more I realized how just similar everything is. Yeah. How so? Like similar to Catholicism? I, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I really do. I really do think they're similar. <laughs> yeah. How so? Like, it's uh, very demanding monks. <laughs> it's demanding. It's patriarchal. There's there's so much oversight and politics that are baked into it. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, there's there's sexual corruption and uh, abuse that happens behind the scenes. And, um, and there's, there's a lot of dogma in every single organized religion. I really mm -hmm, believe that. Mm -hmm, and I, and I don't, I think we live in a time where we think Buddhism is somehow non dogmatic and it's like, <sighs> No <laughs> reality check, huh? Yeah, I mean that's the that's the shadow of that's the shadow of uh, everyone hopping on the scientific Buddhist train, in my opinion. Um, mm. But now you, where did you learn about Buddhism? You went to Naropa, right? You got a degree at Naropa, yeah. which is a like how many Buddhist universities are in the United States? Yeah, not many. Two? And I consider Three. myself, I consider myself Buddhist. Yeah. Yeah. Despite everything, you consider yourself Buddhist. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm like, I consider myself white, and I have to deal with all this bullshit. You know, <laughs> you consider yourself white. Is that what yeah, you said? Like I have, I have to deal with all this bullshit. You know what I mean? Oh my god! Whether it's yeah, you know Catholic, Buddhist, uh, American, <laughs> you know, yeah. being the having colonial ancestors. It's like, I, I have to answer for all this bullshit, you know? Well, you know, that's the great thing about living in Brazil is that I don't have to answer for any of that bullshit. I can just go out the door and live my life. I don't have like a committee of people judging me for everything I think or say, every pronoun I make. I mean, you're in, where you're just outside Boulder, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. I don't think I could handle it there. It's just too woke for me. I can't yeah. handle it. You know, but it sounds like you've really, a, like you take it in and you've really, like you take it seriously, you know, you got to have your pronouns down, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I take, I, it, it's too I much take for it me. seriously enough that <laughs> I take it seriously enough that I, that I, that I really don't know what I'm doing. I think, I think that's like the essence of, cool. being, I think that's the essence of being woke is like. I'm entertaining all these thoughts and then, and then it's, and then I, my life has to be the tip of the spear. How do I want to do this? Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I agree. I mean, this idea that, you know, you go out the door every day and you don't know what you're doing. That's such an honest and humble place to come from. You know, it's, yeah. I, I, I think so. Where my issue with the woke thing is, that when instead of thinking, wow, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm here to sort of learn and relate to people and connect and experiment with different ideas. I just see a lot of the woke culture is their idea is that their mission when they go out the door is to correct every person they meet about everything that they're saying or doing that is ethically not to my level. Yeah. And that pisses me off. <laughs> pisses yeah. Me off. I mean, that pisses me <laughs> off too. And I've, I've kind of been there, done that. I think the be Okay. I think the budding, like the budding movement uh, in like human history is that the, the beginning disciples are the most evangelical. Mm -hmm. like, like the people that are like, okay. Coming up on, coming up on some truth are the ones that are the most excited and passionate about it. And I've certainly been there. I mean, I've been ready to, I've been ready to go Martin Luther and nail treaties on, on the doors of institutions and stuff. I mean, I, I've been, I've been fully intense about anti-racism. I've been fully intense about, about the mad movement. I mean, I did this whole, you would not believe this demonstration I did a few years ago where I was, I, I, I like traveled to, um, the Atlanta airport. And I just, I was, and I was like going insane. I, I was like doing this stage demonstration and I laid down in the atrium in the shape of the crucifixion. And I was convinced that I was making a statement about humanity's just 
full miss of the mark, you know? <laughs> and uh, This was a manic episode, just to clarify, right? Yeah, no. I mean, I, it okay. was, but it but in my mind, I was it was also an act of art and and defiance and something like that. But every every step of the way, when I have these these creative upheavals, and I think they're like gonna, ch- I think they're changing the world. It's like you know, Buddha touches the touches the earth, and everything awakens. It's like it feels like that to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always so anti like anticlimactic. You know, <laughs> like I, I literally had to get a lawyer, a public defense attorney to get out of a hospital one time and was staging like real time resistance medically, legally. It felt spiritual to me. And I remember getting, I remember like getting chained up and taken to the courtroom and and in my mind, I'm like, I'm like John Coffey in the Green Mile. I'm so, I'm like, I am full persecution. I am full resistance. And I sit down in the courtroom and my, my attorney is like, she's acting like she won a, a, a tennis match. You know, she's, <laughs> she's, she's celebrating. She's, she's telling me this never happens. Like I, you know, like we, like we never win. We never actually get someone out of the oh, really the wow. state custody medical system or whatever and she's all excited and i'm thinking like where's my movie <laughs> <laughs> why hasn't anyone made a movie about me yet or like where's the <laughs> where's the news anchor that's like talking about this groundbreaking experience, you know, and what, what was it about your testimony or whatever that actually led to you getting out? That was different from the typical person who, who gets turned down. Well, and I think this is going to pander a little bit to some of the annoying wokeness, but you know, I'm (laughs) white male educated son of a physician who was able to, uh, give me a character testimony. Um, educated in psychology and uh, worked in mental the mental health field. I mean, I could I had my finger on the pulse of every single thing that was happening, even though I was hypomanic or, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, you know, bordering on uh, psychotic, you know. So you just think it really came down to you being a presentable, presentable translation white, right? Yeah. Being a presentable young man from a good family. Mm-hmm. you know translation white <laughs> and yeah. then and then you then you got out just because of that situation even though you were still manic yeah resource and educated i mean there's a lot more that goes into it than just being white i mean some uh, you know the the people think? the oh the the patients in in the hospital with me that were telling me this you know you're an idiot this is not going to work you should just take your meds and this and that they were all white. They were all white men, you know. Oh, uh, they didn't get out. Yeah. They didn't get out. Okay, right? so that brings me my question. You know, usually when people are in the hospital, they if people like my work in the hospital, they're usually fighting the system. I'm not taking the meds. I'm not doing that. I'm going to sue this hospital and all that stuff. Right, right. And 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 what I tell them is, I say, look, you want to get out as soon as possible. Play the game. Yeah. Thank them for being helpful. It's re- you're improving. Uh, the meds are helping you, and that's the and that's the fastest way to get out is to just play the game. So when you were in front of the judge, were you being the revolutionary or were you playing the game? I was totally playing the game. I just I don't okay. think, I don't think I even had to say anything. I think the stage was already set. Like I had to play my part with the lawyer. Okay. You know, like I had to, I had to like have all this stuff in a, in the in line. But at the, by the time I got in front of the judge, I mm. all I had to do was sit there and look pretty. Okay, you know? so you could just in you know suit. you could just put a good thing forward. Okay, in your what? In your suit? In you my wearing suit. a suit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Suits how many, help? How many people get dragged in front of the in front of the judge to decide if they get to be released from the psychiatric hospital in a in a thousand dollars suit? You know. 
You got a point there. It goes back. I, I remember a, a clip from RuPaul on Masterclass. And he was like, you want respect in this world? Wear a suit. Put that suit on. You know, you get in front of people with a suit and tie and they treat you differently. I shave. Uh -huh. I remember the, the person that was. Do you shave? <laughs> I remember you got such a baby face. Yeah, but I I remember the person in the uh that was you know I remember the I had to get approval to use a razor in the hospital to go in front of the court and it was this wow I just remember that it, you know it felt it felt biblical to me I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm shaving and there's a guy you know there's a nurse attendant watching me and I'm and I'm just like it's like I am. I am the prophet of madness or whatever, you know, <laughs> I am, I am putting on the thing, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am Ooh. the warrior. I am the whatever. And like social justice is a big part of a lot of people's manic experiences. Totally. They want to change the world for the better. How much of that, even the, the, what came through in your manic episodes, was part of you writing the book? Like, why did you write a book where you would expose yourself and, and for a lot of people make a fool out of yourself? Yeah. You know, um, risk employment opportunities, you know, and all that stuff. Why, why, why did you decide to do that? Because it's a big risk for people. Well, I think I wanted to push it as far as I could as an example of how both healing could happen, but also the power of story. That's the way I look at it. Uh, I think we need stories to help us make sense of the world. And I think that's part of why we all play out the Christ story. And I think it's part of why we play out the, the revolutionary um, activist, you know, which are, these are all kind of intersecting, intersecting narratives of upheaval of the hero, the modern day hero. I think the modern day hero is, for better or worse, an activist, you know, and you can, act, you know, people on like in, in the States, you know, we have very extreme political polarization right now, but on both sides, they see themselves as activists, liberators, revolutionaries. And I just think that's, that's, that's the hero motif, you know, when we're feeling when we're feeling elevated and activated uh, internally, that's that's where the spirit goes. It goes to how to change the world. I wonder, but but don't you think the right wing, uh, you know, is more of a? We don't want to change the world. We like things the way they were, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I, I don't see right wing politics as as activist, uh -huh. but actually Will Will Hall pointed out to me in a conversation we had once that they've especially in the Trump years that they actually adopted the um, sort of revolutionary speak of Martin Luther King yeah. and put it into the right wing context. Yeah. Um, but really with an agenda just to keep things not as even as they are, but to take things back to where they were in the 1970s, you know? Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, all I can say is that the people I know on the right who feel really impassioned by their political agenda view themselves as trying to retain things like freedom of speech in their mind, pur pursuits of happiness and, uh, the right to bear arms and freedom of religion and all this kind of stuff that are hallmarks of, of the liberties that for better or worse, the United States of America were founded on. Well, you know what? I don't know if we're going to get too far down our list today, which means you're going to have to come back. <laughs> Definitely. Come back. You know, I, yeah. I want everyone to know that you're my favorite person on the internet. I think everything you do is awesome. I think it's, and I'm not, inspires I'm not, other people. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, to be honest, I'm really not on the internet that much anymore. <laughs> this is my first step back for, for quite a while. 
So Maybe that's why that. you're my favorite person on the internet because you're not you're not blasting me constantly, which is the whole thing. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. And you know, there was a scene at the end of the movie, the Netflix movie "Don't Look Up." Oh, uh-huh. um, and um, this kid, he was the he's the son of the or the president, and the world has exploded from a meteor, and he was the last person alive on Earth, right? And he pulls himself out of the rubble and he looks around and there's nothing there. And, and then he pulls out his phone and he goes, yo dudes, like I'm the last person on earth. All right. So, you know, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. And I was like, that's why I left YouTube. Cause I am so sick of just that phony, you know, smash that subscribe button. And for anyone on YouTube, you know, you're watching this video, please smash that fucking subscribe button. Just smash it, you know, <laughs> because, you know, whatever. But yeah, it got annoying. You know, I didn't want to be associated with I know. that level of fakeness, this fake phony thing. I think it, it's not the right word, but yeah, it just got too much for me, you know. So but this felt more like, oh, let's do something a little more personal and get to know you better, too. One thing I wanted to get back to was, um, you know, you had this episode when you're at your first episode in college and this kid dies that you'd barely know. It's a big trigger for your first episode. Mm -hmm. So clearly the death of your friend in this car accident was a tra traumatic experience for you. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. And so, you know, one of the things we were going to talk about is understanding trauma uh, how you see trauma, how it's affected your life, if you've healed from trauma or if you feel like you've been through some healing in your process. I can say confidently that I've had quite a bit of traumatic experiences uh, as far as grief and loss go. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us do. I see it as... Uh, I see it as like a neurological uh, knot that has to be untangled um, and can't can't happen too fast. It's a delicate it's a delicate situation. Okay. So yeah. I feel it a lot around like in in my, where my mind goes is I I have experiences that yeah triggers the right word triggers some memory some somatic memory uh just some some recollection that throws me off and i i notice a dissociative type of experience that happens where i sort of go offline or space out and yeah, you think, is this still happening with you sometimes? You'll get sometimes. triggered and then you kind of check yeah. out. I thought I put a lot of it behind me. And then I had my, I had a, a friend, a spiritual teacher, business partner, uh, uh, self-immolate, which is, which is to say lighting oneself on fire. Wow. wow. And, uh, Was he, did he have a Buddhist orientation? Because I knew that yeah. monks do that sometimes too. Oh yeah. And I wrote this. I had this whole like I downloaded in my in my experience of his Bardo state this whole sodden of God thing and I was I was ready to burn my whole life to the ground and and started to quite frankly you know I lost my marriage and I uh, had to take some time off of school and um it was a it was hor it was a horrible experience and because he was so close in proximity to my work, my school, and my spiritual path, it felt very hard for me to escape how painful that was. It was like everything reminded me of this of guy, what, of what he did. Yeah. And when did you meet this guy? You know, he showed up really like, uh, it was it was almost scary. Showed up at one of my talks at the library, and um, and was just paid paid such close attention to what I was saying, and 
uh, it, it felt like this uh, kind of synchronistic encounter of uh, someone who was on the path or whatever, um, mm -hmm. very, very invested in, in madness and spiritual awakening which I think is great. Oh, really? So yeah. you both, you had a lot in common then? Cause it's, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, had a very similar, uh, view, you know, like in, in Buddhism, we talk about view, you know, what the view is that kind of orients you to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And we just were really connected in that way. And uh, when I look back on it, I think he knew more what he was doing than I realized he did, which was, which was part of what was so disturbing about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, how so? What do you... Like... Like, do you think the setting himself on fire was part of his philosophy of life? Like... I... I think it was like the final act of how he was going to leave the world or, or maybe I shouldn't even say leave the world, but how he was going to exit that, that particular embodiment. It was eerie. I started having flashbacks of various conversations we had and it all kind of went together in the way that a life does, you know? You know, this isn't the first time I'm hearing about this, that devout Buddhists end up killing themselves because they see that as the ultimate extinction of the ego. Yeah, I mean, I, w I don't think it'd be fair to him to, to s really try to say what he was thinking. Um, okay. I, there is a letter that Thich Nhat Hanh wrote to... Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about the self-immolation self of Vietnamese monks during the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. which is which is a fascinating read and kind of kind of spooky in and of its own right. Um, but yeah, it's this idea of like it's not a it's not about ending life; it's about calling attention to suffering and things like that. So it's mm. pretty scary. So yeah. it's, it's, it's possible that he, he did this as a social statement. Oh, well, I feel pretty confident that he did. Okay. As opposed to normally when we think of suicide, we think of somebody who hates their life and they just want to end it to escape their life. You don't think that that was his intention. You, you, you think it was more a social statement. Wow. I think he, That's I strong. think that he saw, uh, setting himself ablaze as the most useful act of his, how, how he could be of most use with his life or wow. with his body. Yeah. yeah. Was he at Naropa? He used to teach at Naropa. Okay, he was a professor there? At one oh. point. Yeah, oh, okay. creative, a writing, writing teacher. Got it, got it. World yeah. traveler and had his own, had his own uh, uh, diagnosis of bipolar and everything, experiences like that, that brought our paths together. Mm -hmm. And we were starting to, put on offerings. I think that's what was so hard for me. We were starting mm. to like uh, plan workshops and present together and mm. yeah. Yeah. And you're still, it seems like you're still carrying it in a pretty strong way. Well, you know, I think I always will, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It was so painful. It's like, you can't forget something like that. Can't forget mm -hmm. something that painful. Mm -hmm. And I try to hold, I, I, th and this is the Buddhist in me, right? Like I try to hold the complexity without trying to reduce it to some just conceptual nugget that I pack away. I see the sanity and the confusion 
of what he did. Okay. Yeah, and maybe maybe we close out our conversation today with just this, you know, you sort of having Buddhism being this big inspiration, and, and my work is is largely inspired by by Buddhism to a certain degree. I don't consider myself a Buddhist though. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what do you think Buddhism has done for you? You know, the philosophical aspects, and what has disappointed you in the reality check of seeing how the rubber hits the road? Well, I feel really clear that Buddhism comes from a a person, so to speak. Like the Buddha was not a Buddhist in the same way that Jesus okay. Jesus was not a Christian. Right. Right. And so I think that's probably the easiest way for me to comment on how I feel like it lacks. Just I think I think when we when we organize around something that is non-conceptual or fully liberated, it's like, you know, it's like trying to deliver the whole thing in a book or deliver the whole Mm -hmm. thing in a podcast episode. It just can't be contained. I'm going to (laughs) try. Yeah. I I think you do a pretty good job, you know, I mean, being open, it's, you know, it's just, I think that when, when people try to organize or conceptualize something as non-conceptual as spirituality can be, we, we can miss it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like miss the bigger picture or the, the bigger, the mystery. The mystery. I think the mystery. Yeah. 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 But still you consider yourself a Buddhist. So where where do you think Buddhism embraces the mystery and where do you think it blocks it off to a certain degree? Or tries to encapsulize it? Yeah. Well I'd be a I'd be a really shitty spokesperson for Buddhism or <laughs> probably anything you know but uh it's, pr- it's pretty hard to be woke and religious at the same time you know uh, yeah i don't know i mean i'm sure the religious folks felt pretty pretty damn woke at some point you know it's like how well we, yeah it's how we got yeah. here yeah some and, people and say woke wokeism is like the new religion which is kind of a fun critique yeah i think it's a religion i yeah. do think it's a religion and it's got its pros and cons you know? mm-hmm. Yeah. But going back to it, the Buddhism. Yeah, give me some dirt. <laughs> well, for, for me, the, for me the practice of meditation is is the whole thing for me. Okay. Mindful, mindfulness and the mis, uh that that open that opening and that refining of every aspect of being human for me is the whole deal. How often are you meditating? Every day. How long? Minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not one of the, you know, I mean, you can, you can teach a dog to sit Mm -hmm. really well. Is that you? I think at one point it was. I I feel limited by my body. If I'm being you mean honest. the the ability to sit in a particular posture for extended periods of time. Yeah, my back. Yeah, yeah there there are limitations for me. Yeah, and just so you know, you know, I I did a ten day vipassana meditation retreat. Did one. Uh, had a kundalini awakening in it and went through a lot of pain because of right. the difficulty of sitting. But they taught us to deal with the pain, you know, so it was cool. Went back a second time two years later, finished the kundalini process, which I'm very grateful for. But I got better at sitting like very still. I was better mm-hmm. and completely destroyed my left knee. Tore the ligaments and the whole bit. Took five years for it to recover. Mm. And it never really became 100%. So like if I go for a jog these days, I wear a knee brace, you know, 
So, <laughs> so people have limitations, you know, we, we can meditate in chairs. It's fine. You don't have to have this perfect posture. And for me, one of the things about some aspects of Buddhism is the strictness around things like posture that I think it's like, I'm sorry, we're not Indian people. We're not that flexible. I think that the nature of, of life now is, is that we have to, we have to always be updating, uh, the, the history and the, the approach, you know? So for, so for me, a, a practice of, of perfect posture is one that's not too tight and not too loose in the same way that a guitar string is not too tight, not too loose. Yeah. And I think there's a lot there. Yeah. My version of not too tight and not too loose is going to look a certain way for my body. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, being honest with myself about what it means to really come into, into tune. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a practice. That's a practice we all have. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one thing, you know, I mentioned I destroyed my knee, but the thing I liked about Buddhism, particularly the Zen tradition, which can be extremely strict, yeah. but there's this idea there. And even on this Vipassana retreat, they tell you things like, don't do any prayers this week. Don't bring any amulets. Don't read any special books because we want you to know that the technique that you're doing is the reason for the results you're having after 10 days, not these other things you're doing. Mm -hmm. You see, they don't want that spurious relationship there. They want to show you that the technique is what's going to bring around the results. And that, first of all, is very scientific, you know, which I like. Yeah, and it speaks to a certain stripped downness that I find in Zen, where it's like, take away everything that's not essential, you know? Um, Cause I, I used to be um, a lot into shamanism. I belong to a sham shamanic group here in Brazil. And I go to these dances, you know, sun, moon dance, no food, no water for three days out in the country, mm -hmm. you know? And, the women would, would all show up, but guys too, but most a lot of the women would show up in these, you know, these native Indian outfits with buffaloes on them and wolves and uh, eagles. And, you know, we're, we're singing native Indian songs and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure these days there would be a big, you know, taboo around cultural appropriation. I didn't care about that. But what I did care about was that, you know what? I'm not indigenous. I'm not an Indian. You know, it's, that's not where I come from. And I wanted something that was a little more authentic, you know, free of dogma, free of myth and, and that kind of thing. And even though Buddhism doesn't have that, some of those Buddhist ideas around stripping things down to the essentials helped me get to a place where my spirituality, my, my only spiritual practice, well, meditation and breath work, you know, but they're they're really stripped of ritual and culture and all that kind of thing it's just just the techniques to a certain degree you know yeah yeah i practice american dharma which is has to be a melting pot for me okay it has it has to be a melting pot approach because i i cannot go all the way th i i cannot find the all the way through line of an authentic practice for me I just know that I have okay. to inhabit my body, mm -hmm. right? And I have to find, for, for me, it comes back to, can I ever expand my capacity to both give and receive love? That has to be sanity for me. Giving mm -hmm. and receiving love. The insights come and go. They're like movies, and uh, mm. there are movies I love to watch and there are movies I come back to and reference. But at the end of the day, they're, they're a movie. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like about Buddhism as well is this idea that, you know, just what you said, you know, you want to give and receive love. But Buddhism is really the only religion that I'm aware of that says, so why aren't we doing that? <laughs> We're... We're not the people that we want to be. And so let's take a closer look at ourselves through meditation to a certain degree 
and and work on that. So there's a strong psychological aspect to Buddhism that you don't really find in Christianity in the same way or um, not not to that degree, you know. And 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 so to a certain extent, my own spiritual practice is I'm not really there yet, you know, giving and receiving love 24 hours a day. I'm not that person. Mm-hmm. So where are my blind spots? And being quite aggressive about looking at the pain in my own life that leads me to project onto other people and create drama and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so I do I do holotropic breath work and forms of that and meditation in order to clean myself up. Yeah. You know? Um, and in that way, the spiritual practice becomes a lot about healing and not so much about enlightenment, you know, because I, I find enlightenment can give people a sort of mountaintop idea. I'm this enlightened person. Mm-hmm. And I'll be honest, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who thought of themselves as enlightened that I actually thought was enlightened. I thought they were all either bipolar or they were just really arrogant, to tell you the truth. Yeah. One, I think that I think that's where it has to come back to love. Like, I think love is the most scientific and spiritual and practical and mysterious barometer for spiritual and psychological wellness. Except you can't measure it, right? And it's familiar so, to everyone. Yeah, but it's but this is the paradox, right? Is you're right. I mean, it, you want to see a person's capacity for love, you know, different forms of it, compassion and all that. Mm-hmm. But science can't find love and compassion. They can't measure these things. They can't measure fear. They can't measure any emotions. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we have a limitation with our scientific method, right? Because we're never going to be able to see, see like scientifically who is a more loving, compassionate person, you or me. Probably from this conversation, people would think you, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Why? Because um, I'm a bit of a smart ass. Uh. <laughs> you just come across very sincere, you know. Okay. But you know, you never know. I mean, and and of course, the whole idea of comparing that is ridiculous. But again, that's what science does. It compares and it measures things. And we're never, I don't think science will ever have a window on the soul that's accurate, to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know? Well, I think the tricky part is there is a neurological reductionism happening right now where uh, monks who practice compassion as a, as a very intentional, very long enduring practice are being measured and how compassionate they are is based on the underlying assumption that it's going to all be neurological, which may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. Um, But then what happens, you know, like, let's say, let's say we find, for example, that uh, you can map the neurology of compassion. Um, What will that do as people try to approach that? Uh, That might, that actually might feel uh, horribly violent horribly painful to try to pursue that the pursuit of that might end up being horribly destructive just as an example i could see a dystopian future where people are trying to make their brain like a like a compassionate monk's brain i could see that how is it dystopian because it sounds like kind of a nice idea it could be dystopian in the sense that a difference could start to be eradicated. The same could be said for like body shape and size, you know, so you could have mm. perfect medical like BMI, for example, and it could feel like a noble pursuit. Let's have everybody be the same BMI. That's pretty much already there, don't you think? I mean, there's so much body pressure on everybody. Um, used to be just women. Now it's men, too. Yeah. Um, strictly, you know, you know, the whole... Once things all went skinny for men, too, yeah. 
that was like, oh, guess what? You got to have 5% body fat or you're a pig, you know? Mm -hmm. Where does that come from, you know? So, but like the, the brain might end up, like that might happen with the brain too, right? Because if everyone can measure, ah. if you can put on headphones and measure your brain and be ever approaching a type of brain, that mm. project, that project might have ramifications mm. in a similar way. Sure. Because you go for a job interview and then they put the brain wave scanner on you. Then they say, well, Chris, your brain activity is too high. We can't hire you despite your qualifications. You're you're not enlightened enough. Yeah. That's spooky. That would be a good movie. I think a movie around the trappings of spirituality would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, we're always living that, right? Yeah. yeah. We're always living that movie. <laughs> I guess. I guess. It's all the Truman Show, right? This is all the Truman Show. <laughs> yeah. We do it. We do it to ourselves. All right, man. Well, I know you got to go. And thanks a lot for your time. If anyone wants to contact Chris, they can do so at, where is it, Chris? Colecoaching.com? Yeah, at least for now. Okay. Yeah. And Chris, you know, I really enjoyed the conversation. And so we'll definitely be doing this in the future when you've got a second. All right. I would love that anytime and any way I can support you. Uh, please let me know. You've been such a blessing in my life. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You almost embarrassed me, but I appreciate your support. Thanks. I could use a little right now. <laughs> <laughs>